We'll be again in the fourth chapter of Ephesians tonight. This will be our 40, 43rd installment. Now we're entering into a chapter here that's going to have a lot of uh, information about what God intends for the church to be now. He's already unfolded to us what what the end objective is. So he's going to tell us what what the, what's going on right now. And then in the part of this chapter, there'll be some strong exhortations. Like he'll say, be renewed. <laughs> yeah, only God can say something like that. But he did, be renewed. He'll say, and he'll tell you to put away certain things. It'll not be like try and do this or make an effort. Or, so he's preparing us for that. Yeah. That's what he's doing in this text. Now anytime you have a, an exhortation, a strong exhortation, which are very rare these days. Exhortations are very, very rare these days. So I'm thankful that we've, we've kind of experienced a renewal of this and may it spread to other places. Before he exhorts you, he calls your attention to the Lord that called you and to the benefits he's given you. He kind of sets the context for it before he exhorts you. In the epistles to the Ephesians, Paul has first identified God. See, you may think, well, everybody knows who God is. No, everybody doesn't know who God is or that he is. So he identified who he was, who he is. He said, for instance, uh, he bestows grace and peace. Started right out telling you. Comes from him. He's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people don't think of this. They really don't think of God as the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Not only is Jesus the Son of God, that's accented, but He's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And He is uh, He's the one that blessed us as, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It's God that chose us. It's God that predestinated us is God that made us accept it. See, this is all in, a, in this first chapter. It's God that has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's made known to us the mystery of his will. He has determined he's going to gather everything together into one. He's the one who works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's the one who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him to be hit over all things. God did this. And it's God who quickened us. He raised us up to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. God did this. Is We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And it's the manifold wisdom of God that's being made known to principalities and powers. That's just some things God has done. Not is do it, has done. In Christ Jesus, he's the one whom God chose, through whom God chose us. He's the one through whom we've been adopted. He's the one in whom we're made accepted. See? We have redemption in his, through his blood. And all things are gathered together in him. And it's in Jesus we obtain the inheritance. See how they, he's, he's building quite a, quite a intellectual structure here. He's, we've been, uh, the church is uh, Christ's body, a repository into which he pours his fullness. We've been made nigh to God by Christ's blood. He's our peace. He abolished the enmity that separated us from God. And through him both Jews and Gentiles have access to God. He's the foundation upon which we're built. He's the chief cornerstone. It's in Jesus that we're fitly framed together. God created all things by Christ. It's Christ who dwells in our hearts. Hearts that are made strong by the Holy Spirit. 
And the unwavering intention of God is to receive glory in the church by Christ Jesus. See, see that's how much he said about God and Christ. A lot, isn't it? Now, it's in the context of those statements that we're reading in chapter, <laughs> chapter 4. If people like context, that's, that's pretty good context there. Oh, but there's a lot of people. They don't know this. So they're trying to do what should be done without this, a grasp of this knowledge. And most of the time it's just because they haven't heard it. Some people be glad to hear this. They just, just heard it. And they may view the scriptures as well as up over my head, you know. I, I can't understand it. I haven't been trained. And there's some people think this way. We know we know this is wrong, but the people have in a sense been taught to think like this. Alright, we're in the fifth verse tonight. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Whew, boy, that's a lot. We'll only be able to kind of skim over it, but it's, there's important things to see here. The, the, there is, he starts it with verse 4, there is. So these are realities. These are not ought to be. This is what is. There is and any one body, one spirit, one hope. There is one Lord. That's, that's really all there is, just one. We have only one Lord. Some versions say, let there be but one Lord. <laughs> I don't like that. You have one master. I don't like that either. Give it what's true. I mean, it's just true. That's not what he's saying. Yeah. He's just saying you have one. That's not what he's saying. As though you initiated. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He said, actually, the original language just says one Lord. Yeah. It just doesn't say there is. or yeah. That's just one. And it's a statement of fact. Yeah. Amen. This is the way it is. Yeah. One Lord. Yeah. Foundational statements concerning deity are never grounded in human experience. See, when you make a statement about deity, you don't you don't couch it in this is what he is to us or the, or we. The, some of that is true, but that's not that's not foundational. Yeah. God is whether he's whether you're involved in it or not, right. knowledgeably involved in it or not. This is what it is. God is. It's wrong to represent foundational statements as though it was a God and me situation. You've got to have a foundation before you talk about God and me. There has to God has to do something before we can have even God and me. Yeah. Amen. And what he's telling you well God has in fact done something. So this is the this is the good news of course. Now there's something we ought to address here. Paul made a statement to, to the Corinthians it sounds like it contradicts this. He says, though there be many that are called gods, whether in heaven and in earth, is there be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So he said, well, what's the difference between that statement and this? Well, in that statement, Paul is talking about brethren to brethren. Some of these converted idolaters didn't know there was one God. Now, the eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians is devoted to it. They thought these were really legitimate gods, but they just weren't to be a worship, but they were really the legitimate gods. And so consequently, if they, when they went to the meat market, some of the meat that was offered to these idols was sold in the meat market, the shambles. They called it the shambles in the King James. So they wouldn't buy this meat, but they might see some brother who knew that nothing wrong, I can buy the meat. Paul said, you can buy the meat. But if someone sees you that doesn't know what you know, and they see you smoking, oh, I'm sorry, you don't want to make it too personal. Or do we? And they see you doing this or that, and they don't know what you know. 
says, so, so I'd rather not eat meat while the world stands. So that's what he's talking about there. So it, there really aren't many gods, but some people thought there were many. And when he says, to us there's one God, he doesn't mean this is what we believe. <laughs> he means we've been given some insight on this. God's, God's revealed this to us, that there are other powers, but they're not gods. Amen. They're not lords. One. Amen. One Lord. Oh, I love the truth. The word Lord, this is, this is a big word. I'll give you the lexical meaning. And this, just, this just beats around the bush, but it's, it, even that says a lot. Lord. One having power or authority, he to, who, who, he to whom a person or a thing belongs. About which he has the power of deciding. He's master or lord. He's possessor and disposer, the owner. One who has control of a person. That's what there's only one. It's only one of those. Amen. And he is. He's the Lord is the owner. Yeah. You're not your own. Mm -hmm. You're bought with a price. Right. And you don't decide what you need to do. He decides what you need to do. See, you know, this is a this is a bridge that a lot of people haven't crossed. Understand. You're not the one that plots your course. He plots it. Yeah. One Lord. Now this is speaking, we're going to point out, it, this is not speaking of God the Father. He's going to mention God the Father in the next verse. This is speaking of Jesus Christ, who's been made Lord. He, God has made him Lord. We're so speaking about the person of Christ. Eight times in the book of Ephesians, this expression, Lord Jesus Christ, is mentioned. We also have Christ Jesus our Lord, that's mentioned. Now how, do, how does Christ fit into this e economy? The Lord, see, he, he's been Lord. He's running everything. God has turned it over to him. God hasn't abdicated. Yeah, amen. Understand? Mm -hmm. He's not subject to Christ, but he's the only one that isn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's the only one that isn't. He being accepted that put all things under him. That's how the scripture puts it. Well, when you get to talking about Christ, you get to talk about all spiritual blessings in Christ. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm showing here that the Lord is like the owner and the distributor. He's the one that has charge of everything. You want something from God, you got to get it from Jesus. Amen. God will not deal person to person with you. <coughs> you got to go through Christ. No man comes to the Father but by me, either initially or any other time. Amen. That's because God turned the things over to him. Jesus said when he's on earth, the Father put everything in my hand. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me now. He's Lord. Talking about Jesus, well, they... It's in Jesus that the t body of Christ is being framed for a temple of God. Uh -huh. In Christ, it says, this is being framed. And you get to talking about God's eternal purpose. He purposed in Christ. And the Father is the Father of Christ. He's our Father too, but first he's the Father. The reason he's your father, by creation he's your father. By redemption he's Christ's father first and your father because of that. You have the same father as Jesus does, so God's not, a, he's, Jesus isn't ashamed to call you brethren. <laughs> and God's not ashamed of you either because you're, you're related to him in Christ. I'm showing the centrality of Christ. You walk as children of light, that's connected with being in Christ. Third chapter, verse 4. Even singing. We let the word of Christ dwell in your mercy. And you sing to the Lord. And there are a number of other, uh, other things. God is referred to in the Bible as Lord in the, in the epistles 115 times. Jesus is called Lord 411 times. Just 
just to confirm to you that everything's to Christ. So there isn't a Jewish God and a Muslim God and a Christian God. That's right. There's one God and there's one Lord. Amen. There's one personality who's over everything. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this applies to after he ascended back into heaven and seated at the right hand of God. And at that point, Peter announced in Acts 2.36, God hath made him both Lord. See, the earth is the only place personalities don't bow to Jesus now. All the demons do. Poof. They even did when he was incognito in the body. No demon ever give Jesus any trouble at all, ever. Gave men a lot of trouble. Satan, they, Satan never even argued with Jesus. Not one time. Amen. He's the Lord. He knew he was Lord. All the angels know he's Lord. Cherubim, seraphim know he's Lord. Just on earth, men are the only ones that don't know he's Lord. But he is. There is. <laughs> one Lord. The earth knows he's the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's right. Nature, nature knows it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, nature always obeyed him when he told him to do anything. He instantly obeyed. He said, peace, be still. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet around right now. You remember that uh, Peter, 10 years after Pentecost, he goes to Cornelius' household. There's a, there's a lot of people there. And he told him of Jesus Christ, he is, he is Lord of all. See, he says, the one Lord. Although Satan is, he's called the God of this world. And the whole world lies under his sway. 1 John 5, 19, the whole lieth in the wicked one, is the way the text says, means it's under his power. But his is a delegated power. He's really not a Lord. The Lord delegated Satan, his power. Satan's power came from God. Well, that, that doesn't make sense. But that, it does because God set this whole thing up. Amen. God had fully intended that salvation was going to be worked out in an adversarial environment. Right. He fully intended there's going to be a fundamental adversary that his people were going to overcome through his power. So he gave Satan to do, he could do almost anything except touch the people that Jesus Christ is. Amen. In whom Jesus Christ dwells. That he can do. And if he does, he got permission to do it. Right. So if you're going through a knot hole, powers of darkness had permission to drag you through that knot hole. That's, right. Amen. That's, that's how you have to look at it. That's the way it is. But they can't go any further than God let them go. And he's not going to let them go beyond your what you can stand. We can see this with um, Brother Job how um, Satan was continuously tempting him, but the Lord continued to limit his power. That's Amen. right. You can see how Job overcame this. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's right. Amen. He, yeah, he, God drew a line. You can go this far, no further. That's right. This far, no further. You can take what he's got, but you can't touch his body. You can touch his body, but you can't kill him. Yeah. And Satan didn't object. That's right. Yeah, that's not fair. That's not right. He didn't object. He just stuck his tail between his legs and went away. There wasn't anything else he could do. That's why you can't be distracted by trial. It's the business of everybody who speaks for God to inform people what this life is all about. This life isn't about comfort and ease. It's, a, it's about qualifying to enter into the gates yeah. <laughs> of the city. Yes. And he, God is the one that will qualify you for it. Mm -hmm. So the reign of Jesus, incidentally, is consistently associated with his saviorhood. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. really got to really got to see that. Excuse me. It's associated with his with his saviorhood. <coughs> and you this day is born, mm -hmm. and us is given a son, 
and the government will be upon his shoulder. Now the increase of his government, there shall be no end. See, Jesus being king or being Lord is not connected with his second coming. Yes, amen. It's connected with his saving the world, saving sinners. That's what Jesus has been exalted not to defeat the devil. He's already done that. He destroyed the devil and plundered principalities and powers, and they're the worst foe. So he's not going to have trouble with the kings of the earth. Yeah, right. But Matthew. Yeah, I think that some people's perception of salvation, they don't see it as needing a reigning Savior. That's right. You're That's exactly right. right. Amen. Just repeat these words after me. It's real easy. Jesus defeated the devil when he was at his lowest that's right. possible place. That's exactly right. Mm, weakness. Yeah. In weakness. He was mm -hmm. crucified through weakness. And the cross is where it was done. That's right. Wasn't, Satan wasn't defeated from heavenly places. He is defeated from the cross. Amen. That's where he was defeated. So Jesus has no trouble with Satan. He's just bring, he bringing the people through his territory. And because they are really the ones being saved, he like doesn't just levitate them and they float over the enemy. You know, I think some people think it's got to float over the enemy and the glory. No, he takes you right through the battle lines. I don't know how mad Satan was beforehand, but his anger and, and wrath was accelerated oh, oh, yeah. after he was after Jesus had ascended and all everything he thought was going so well yeah, that's kind right. of worked against him. Now we really need a, we need we need Christ reigning. That's right. Yes. See, when he saw he when he saw he was woe to you inhabitants of the earth, for the devil's come down to you having great wrath. He can't, he's going to work. His wrath doesn't mean anything up here. Right. Yeah. It only means on the earth. Yeah. He didn't bank on it. What Jesus does, he lifts you up. He lifts you up above the earth into heavenly places. And see, Satan can't enter there. Yeah, right. He can't get in there. Uh -huh. if you, so if you, if you just say, well, I'll go out and mosey around on earth for a while. That's, yeah, that's, right. that's where he is. Uh -huh. That you're in his domain and he'll knock you down every time. You will never win a skirmish with Satan if you're living in the flesh. Amen. Won't happen. There's a complicating factor in that he's delivering people who were once darkness. That's right. So there's some elements about their character that have to be yeah. shed. That's right. And they can only be shed in this environment. Amen. Yeah, amen. Now you see, when a person... No person who has come into Christ can say, well, that was the end of any of my weakness or sin. I never sinned after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I will tell you, to get out of that sin, it took a Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord had to lift you up out of that. Yeah. The Lord had to forgive you. Yes. You, couldn't climb, you couldn't climb out of the pit. Yeah. Amen. Not even the second, third, fourth, or fifth time. Yeah. He... Salvation needs a Lord to direct it Amen. and to ensure that it's brought to its intended culmination. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is absolutely sovereign. Mm -hmm. He's not like a figurehead. Well, sometimes there'll be a, a retiring executive and he'll be the president emeritus. Yeah. Yeah, he really doesn't run the show, but he... He's treated like he's the president, but he really doesn't have any. That's not how, what Jesus is. Amen. Jesus is Lord of all. He's the one and only potentate. That's First Timothy six fifteen. Not he shall be. He is. God's going to show who he who he is now is going to be revealed when Jesus comes again. He's going to show who is. The one and only potent day. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Amen. That's what he is. And he's the ultimate owner. Yes. You were bought with a price. You're not your own. I mean, we were reminded. Mm -hmm. We were reminded of that. So there's only one lord. He's over everything. Powers of darkness as well as holy angels. He's over them all. 
You don't need anything that you can't get from Jesus. Amen. Nothing. In fact, your your it summarized as your need. He is able to meet all of our need. Yeah. Singular need. Yeah. Now some people think they need things they really don't need, as you know. One Lord. And all men will give account to him. There is one Lord. So when I tell you what I'm going to exhort you to do, Paul is saying, think back what I said here, one Lord. And there's one faith. Someone say, say, well, what faith are you of? Yes. Well, I'm of the Catholic faith. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm a Merciless of the Baptist faith, or whatever. There's one faith. That's all there is. Amen. Not that not there should be one faith. That's all there is. Amen. Any other kind of faith is not faith. It's a delusion. It's not faith. Amen. Now the word faith, it's good to think about what it is. It's one of those words that's hard to, hard to define. So that here's the lexical definition of faith but you, you can kind of sense it's like a blind hog rooting for an acre and they're trying to figure out what it is but it's so profound they can't. Conviction of the truth of anything. In the New Testament a conviction of belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor born of faith and joined with it. See it's just... <laughs> It's like walking around in the great big circle. You're not really saying anything. Why? Because faith this is a big word. There's one faith. Faith is when you're able to you're able to take hold of the things of God and use them. Faith is when you not just have access to God. You actually are familiar with God. And you know how to bring him to bear mm -hmm. in your life. You know how to do this. Uh -huh. Faith is one faith. It's a substance of things hoped for. You, mm -hmm. I like to say faith substantizes mm -hmm. spiritual reality. Until faith comes, you only have theories yeah. Amen. and suppositions. That's, that's all you got. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid a lot of Contemporary Christianity is theory and supposition. It's not, it's not substance yeah. Yeah. or conviction. Not that at all. You can tell that experientially when you challenge someone about their faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone who, who has a textbook faith. Textbook faith. Who has yes. a lexical faith. Yeah. Yeah. They'll back down. Yeah. Well, maybe you're right about that, or or that's you know that's one view yeah. of it, and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. They almost whatever you talk to them about, that's that's how they view. They won't stand up to you. Mm -hmm. And then you've probably heard people say, "Well, everybody has faith in something." Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's one faith, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's not knowing you're going to get a paycheck, yeah. or knowing that a chair is going to hold you. Yeah. That's not faith. That's Faith has to do with what you cannot verify mm -hmm. by your any of your senses. Yeah. You can't verify that it's there by any human sense or ability. Mm -hmm. Amen. The only proof you've got is that God said it. That is the sum Amen. total of your proof. Amen. You don't have any more. Yes, but is. when you have faith... You don't need any more. Right. You're more convinced of it than if you could see it and handle it. Right. Why, did, why did Paul go through what he went through? All those trials he went through. He listed them in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 11. Why was he, how was he able to do this? Because he knew. Mm -hmm. He had <laughs> faith. He knew. He knew God. Yeah. That's the same with you. Yeah, you can go through trials crying. Saying, please, please, please pray for me. You can go through them like that. But that like is not the ideal. <laughs> That's not the ideal. We understand that everybody probably has to cross that bridge. But you got to get off that road. you got to get beyond that. Yeah. you got to get say I, say, I know the things that have fallen out to me are going to be for my salvation. Uh -huh. You've got to be able to say that. Faith enables a person to say that. 
So Job loses, it's a one fell soup that shows you how fast Satan can work. He just took everything in a day. Everything, everything he had, he took it in a day. He said the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How could he say that? He had faith. Amen. There's only one faith that can do that. Yes. Scriptures, in Scripture, faith is associated with certitude. Why is it some people in and out, up and down, on and off? They fall easy, go backward easy. Why is that? They don't have faith. Yeah. Amen. We stand by faith. That's what the scripture says. Yeah. Yeah. You can say, well, they made a mistake. No, this, wasn't, this is not true. Yeah. Uh -huh. They didn't have faith. They didn't believe. They weren't sure of God. They weren't certain of the judgment day. They weren't positive about grace. That's why they stumbled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody who walks in the light, Jesus says, stumbles. Amen. Amen. Synonyms for the English word of faith, just for the English word. This is back when the, the English was more theological. Synonyms for it are confidence, dependence, hope, reliance, persuasion. See, they're all strong statements. And where these are missing, faith is not found. There's one faith. The stronger faith is, the more certain the person is. The more confident they are. The more assured they are. It's harder to turn a person who's persuaded. That's right. Amen. Remember it says Abraham was fully persuaded. That's right. What God had promised, he was able also to perform. He didn't, wasn't that he saw God or shook hands with God. All he had was what God said, but see... If faith comes by hearing, not hearing what I say, hearing what God says, mm -hmm. faith comes that way. So Abram, Abraham stands out as a, like a spiritual spectacle to us that whenever God said anything to him, he never balked. Amen. He never acted contrary to what God said. Mm -hmm. If you view it, you say, well, he, look at there, he... He tried, he, he went along with Sarah about having a child through Hagar. But see, God hadn't told him. Amen. As soon as God told him, Sarah, that's the end, no more, no more Hagar. Yeah, that's right. At first, he, he said he was going to have an heir, but he didn't tell him, Abram, you're going to beget the heir. So he thought, oh, Eliezer, he's, mm -hmm. he's my steward of my house. He's be the one. But as soon as God told him, mm -hmm. that was no more talk about Eliezer. See? First time, you just have to go through Scripture to see. But the first time he's told, he acted on it. That's faith, what faith does. This is, Abraham is the embodiment of faith. He's faith lived out, chronicled in a person's life. There it is, right there. And you must know that Abraham, even though he had a lot less that is given in Christ, he's light years ahead of most professing churchmen. And this is, this is not commendable. It's not commendable for someone who had less than you to advance further than you advanced. Even in the world, I've seen this happen even in the world. I've seen people that weren't as talented and didn't have as much ability rocket further than someone who was had a lot of ability because they were lazy or slothful or whatever and they actually the person went further than the person who had who had more yeah. but in Christ Jesus the person who has more he will not get to heaven if he does less with it Amen. now Jesus told some parables about yeah, this yeah. cast him into outer darkness and so forth he he spelled this out, so if, if we do not go further with what we've got than what Abraham and the saints of all did with what they got, you as well not talk about going to heaven. It won't happen. It would disgrace Christ and disgrace God. It'd be a contradiction 
to everything about salvation. I know that people will say, well, that's judging. Well, they're going to be judged that way in the end. Yeah, that's right. Those who didn't receive the love of the truth, he tells you what's going to happen. Yeah. Actually, his brother were handicapped compared to us. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. It's like, like a pig-legged man. It's like running a race with a pig-legged yeah. man or something. It says they were not made perfect without us. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. They, they saw the promises well. We're living right smack in the middle of them. They saw them afar off or persuaded of them. God having provided some better thing. You see, faith can be very, very strong even though the person knows very, very little. That's the way faith is. Faith, of course, is obtained from God. He comes to man on the wings of grace. The grace of God is exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 1.14 says, and Ephesians 6.23 says, it's from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they only, he gives only one, <coughs> only one faith. That's all there is. Anything else is, is, is spurious. Yeah. It's fictitious. It's not real. In Scripture, it refers to certain novices as being weak in faith. It doesn't say they had a weak faith. Yeah. Right? It doesn't say, it doesn't say that they were weak in faith. Yeah. Amen. The weakness was owing to their lack of knowledge and understanding. That's why they were weak in faith. They, they, didn't, they, had, they didn't have all the things, facts before them. Couldn't see them all. They were weak in faith. Something else that, that the weakness was in them and not in faith. Yeah. What was that again? The weakness was in the person. Yeah, not in the faith. Yeah, That's exactly right. Uh -huh. Yeah, it doesn't say they had a weak faith. Uh -huh. They were weak in faith. Owing to their lack of understanding. I actually, people who think you can be like a spiritual dumb cluck and have a lot of faith. There, yeah. there are people who believe this. I'd hate to have to try and prove that, though. In fact, I would challenge someone who believes that to get to it and prove it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Faith comes by hearing. How can a lot be said and a person have just a little bit of faith? Mm -hmm. This is not how it works. Yeah, See, we're living in the day. This is the day of salvation. This is the acceptable year. Yeah. The thing God promised all along that the ancients wished they had, yeah. we've got. Amen. In Christ Jesus, one, one faith. Yes. You know, that little faith. That's based on what was said about like you have faith that's a yeah. seed, grain mm -hmm. of mustard seed. You know, you could say to this mountain, well, that's what that's based on. But I would think it's more the potential of the seed that's, that's emphasized, exactly not the size it. of mm -hmm. the seed itself. Yeah, the yeah. seed mustard seed didn't stay a seed. He told you it grows into the largest of all trees. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Seed has the capacity to grow. It just has to be given the opportunity to grow. And if it's given that opportunity, then it will grow. Yeah. Yeah, it's ironic that, that at, during this time, when the greatest light's shining, that they would be foretold that there must first be a falling away. Yeah, falling away. So, I mean, it, it, you see, well, well, of course, when the greater light's shining, everybody will believe. Well, see, yeah. but that's not necessarily true because it has to be given unto you to believe. That's right. Now let's take as an example that the amount of the amount of faith that you have is not what is little or big. Uh -huh. yes. We'll take Abraham for an example. Now his understanding was comparatively very small compared to what we have received in Christ Jesus. But here's what it says of him: not being weak in faith. Yes, that's right. So if weak in faith just meant that you. You just didn't know much, even though a lot had been said. He didn't know much, comparatively speaking. But he wasn't weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Listen, there is no reason, valid reason, why any believer should fall away. Amen. If there was Abraham, he would have fallen away. He didn't fall away. 
And look how little he had. You could, you could write, easily write it on a 3 by 5 card, everything Abraham, mm -hmm. Abraham knew from God. God never did reveal anything to him about like eternity. Uh -huh. yeah. Huh? There's nothing like that was revealed to him. About eternal purpose. About redemption in Christ Jesus. About obtaining an eternal inheritance. About having eternal life. None of that was revealed yeah. to Abraham. Yeah. But he was strong in faith because he capitalized on what he knew mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and believed it. Now there's only one kind of faith, valid faith. There's one faith, that's all. It's the kind Abraham had. That's why he was raised up. There's just one faith. That's all there is. So if a person is, unlike, is fundamentally unlike Abraham in their response to God, let's state it that way, then they don't have faith. It doesn't make any difference what they say. It doesn't make any difference what they say. There's one faith. And if it's not the kind Abraham had, then we've got multiple kinds of faith. And we, that's not possible. Yeah? Abraham's an example of several things that you've affirmed so far about faith being based on what the Lord said, because we're in a generation where they try to say tangible things promote faith. You know, like we can prove these certain people and places in the Bible exist. That'll promote your faith. Or we got all these manuscripts. They're all consistent. That'll, yeah, that'll build faith that what God yeah. said hasn't been corrupted. But Abraham, like when he was told to sacrifice Isaac, you know, you say he was persuaded that God would raise him from the dead. Do you have proof that that would happen? No. Yeah. Or, well, they said they're an empty tomb. Well, I mean, or even Sarah giving birth to Isaac. I mean, what, yeah. what kind of proof did he have that something like that happened? But he believed. All he He's had right. was God's word. So, I mean, that's our ultimate example there. From Amen. 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 Now, when genuine faith is possessed, people move. There's only one faith. People move toward the same mind and the same judgment. Now, it may take a while to get there because we've got to overcome a lot of things sometimes, but they're moving toward this. Yeah. This way, eventually this way it's going to be. When it all is wrapped up, everyone stands, is, that is in the household of faith stands before God and is given eternal inheritance, there's going to be no disagreements. Yeah, there's not going to be any first church, second church. There's not going to be any of that kind of thing at all. Yeah, right. So when every people aren't moving toward why aren't they? Somebody's not got faith. Yes, that's right. Now, it's not our job to try and determine who this is. It's our job to determine it, whether we are in the faith. Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the important thing. And you'll find yourself moving into accord with historical figures that had the faith that maybe you didn't used to think they did. But all of a sudden, your faith... Oh, if you finally catch up to where they were several hundred years ago, lo and behold, you're of one mind. Yeah, yeah the, the reason it says there's one faith is because what, and God, God has defined it, but there's no discrepancy in its constitution or object. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Brother Gavin? Yes. As we've been going through this and tell me if I'm correct in this, the reason why I'm, I'm in, I don't feel comfortable with the, uh, them translating it one trust and one belief, because I don't think that the, be, believing and faith are synonymous terms. They, they're associated with each other, but believing is the effect of having faith. Yeah. But faith is like a spiritual capacity that enables you to believe. Yeah, it's, it's stronger than capacity. Yeah, it's stronger than capacity. But believing is is faith expressed. It's the expression of faith. Yeah, faith is, its capacity is a, is a kind of a weak word. It's stronger than capacity. Yeah, because you have by creation, you have a capacity. You're made in the image of God, but see, it's the capacity is not it. There's, a, there's an actual reality called faith that comes. Then when you believe, that's the expression of the, that's the verb. Faith is the noun. It's the expression of faith. Yeah, so 
Yeah, trust, it's an aspect, but it's not, it's not a total, it's not as big a word as faith. Faith is a larger word. But see, in the English language, they, you understand these are eternal concepts. They're, there's no language that contains this, these kind of ideas. There's no language that has a it has a scriptural idea of faith encapsulized in a word. There isn't any. God had to God had to create this idea. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, that's an important point to make the one faith. Mm -hmm. This accounts for the things that we can recognize in one another, the commonness. Uh, yeah. the, the, the fruit of right. uh, faith is the same mm -hmm. that's right. uh, in all of us, and it's, it's it. Uh, you don't one faith will not produce uh, a different purpose or no. different objectives. Right. It all has yeah. one faith has one objective, one, right. and we all experience the fruit Amen. of the work of that one faith. We're all looking that's, at the same Lord. That's right. Faith, one Lord, one faith, uh -huh. one baptism. Now that we get into a controversial area here, but I think we can work this out here tonight. Some versions say one immersion. Well, immersion is not a proper translation of the word baptize. You can immerse something and leave it under the water. There are still some boats that are still immersed in water that sunk a hundred years ago. So it's not a proper word. That's why they transliterated baptized, because in baptism it's coming up that's the main thing, not going down. Going down gets you in a position where you can be raised up. <laughs> now it appears in Scripture that there is more than one baptism. There's names some of them, like there's the baptism of John. There's the baptism of suffering. Luke 12, 50, Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? There's a baptism of death. If the dead rise not, why am I, ba why am I baptized for the dead? That's what he's talking about. I'm baptized in hope of the resurrection is what he was saying. Some people, proxy baptism, I mean Mormons practice this, but no Christians as I used to baptize one another for somebody else. Yeah, we admit they do, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He was baptized, he submitted to be engulfed by death so he could be raised up by Christ. Then there's uh, Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. John baptized you with water. He that comes after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And we're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, and we're baptized by one spirit into one body, 1 Corinthians 12.13. Oh, it sounds like a different baptisms. But this baptism he's talking about, one baptism, is confirmed by the apostles to be the entrance point into the kingdom of God which is what he's talking about, being part of what God is doing. How do you, how do you get involved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Baptism is the entry point. Paul referred to it as being baptized into Christ. Yeah. Now, nobody can do this. Yeah. Amen. No man can baptize you into Christ. Right. Even though this, this would be, I'd be called a heretic in some circles That's right. mm -hmm. for saying that. But you can't put anybody into Christ. Yes. Amen. You can't do anything but put them in the water and bring them out, and that's all you can do. Uh -huh. Amen. But much more is involved in getting in Christ than that. That's involved, but it's uh -huh. <laughs> baptized into Christ. Paul, he, he, he puts a microscope to this, makes it a little larger. He says, we were baptized into his death. Oh, how's that? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's so much for 2,000 years ago. I've heard a lot of 2,000 years ago preaching. Maybe you have too. 2,000 years ago. We're baptized into his death that occurred, historically occurred, 2,000 years ago. But that death is still something into which we're baptized. Yeah. Amen. Into his death, he also said we we were planted together 
in the likeness of his death, and then we are raised up in the likeness of his resurrection. We are also baptized into one body, as I said. There's also a sense in which baptism saves us, the like figure into baptism does now also save us, Peter said. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, some of the versions say, not washing dirt from the body. I tell you, I don't know how some of these people got into the translation business. What he's saying is it's not a ceremonial cleansing. Like the washings under the law, they were very real washings, but they were nothing really happened. They were ceremonial washings. That's pretty close to what was practiced in the group I was in. That's pretty close to it. It was a it was largely a ceremonial yes. uh-huh. ceremonial thing. I knew it was because hardly anybody was made new. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you just had to be honest. Yeah. Uh-huh. We didn't have this experience. We had a whole flood of baptisms, you know, and sometimes there would be a whole flood of them. Mm-hmm. When Eva and Benjamin were baptized, we had a whole, whole flood of young people were baptized. In most churches, when that happens, there's not a bunch of people who are one heart and one soul. None of them said that any of the goods that they possessed was their own. We never saw anything like that happen. But that did happen when people were really baptized into Christ. One baptism. Now, the Scriptures associate baptism with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his disciples, after he told them to make disciples, King James says, teach all nations. That's what making disciples is, teach, teaching them. And it's only, only disciples are to be baptized. Mm-hmm. Nobody else. A disciple is one that picks up his cross and follows Jesus, denies himself, mm-hmm. leaves all. That's what a disciple is. They were baptized. He baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That wasn't like a formula. Because there's no record of anybody ever saying anything when anyone was baptized in the Bible. Yeah. Yet the big people make a big, not a formula. Mm-hmm. In the name means, I put it in my own words here, that you were baptized into a living relationship with God mm-hmm. and Christ and the Holy Spirit. You bet you identified with them officially. The name stands for their person. Now, now I want to show how active the Father, Son, and Spirit were in baptism. Remember, the one baptism. Now, concerning the Father, his work at this time is referred to as the operation of God, as Colossians 2.12. It's a working that, according to 1 Corinthians 1.30, God put us in Christ. God, in our baptism, forgave us for Christ's sake. And forgive us all trespasses, Colossians 2.20. He's the one who raised us to walk in newness of life. And he, he's the one that made us a workmanship created in Christ Jesus. See, that all happened in this baptism. The Father did that. You were baptized. You were put into a place where God could do this. See? Now let's look at the Son. What does the Son do when you're baptized? Well, He performs a circumcision upon you. Circumcision of the heart. Circumcision of Christ is called in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. This occurs in your baptism. In other words, He, he severs the flesh mm-hmm. from you. Amen. So that there's a great gulf between the two. <laughs> oh, it's good to think about, isn't it? Amen. Now, Jesus does that. And Jesus, he makes us free. When did he make you free? So it's your baptism here. You were freed. It's what Romans 6 says. You were freed from sin. Mm-hmm. Referring to your baptism. Who did that? Jesus did that. He says, if the Son makes you free, you're really free. Amen. 
and stand fast in liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Galatians 5 1. So he did that in, in your baptism. He received you in your baptism. The scriptures say in uh, Romans 15 7, He received us to the glory of God. So that happened. And He makes us alive unto God, Romans 6, 11. And our old man is crucified with him in baptism, Romans 6, 6. And we're saved, baptism saves us by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. See, so Christ is involved yeah. in a baptism. The Holy Spirit, he's involved too. The Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 11, washes, sanctifies, and justifies us. And he, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, says he baptizes us into one body. That's what it says. The Spirit baptizes us into one body. All right, there you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all working in this one baptism. Now the question, when do they do all these things that I read? When are those things done? When you repeat the sinner's prayer? That one is done? Or some other, when you baptize as an infant, is that when all of that's done? No. It's done in the one baptism. That's, right. that's when it's done. Who would dare to say that the ones being baptized are the main persons involved? Well, some people, you'd think that's what they meant. No, the main personnel is involved in your baptism with the Father, uh -huh. the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if they had not been involved, you did nothing more than taking a dip in the water. That's, right. That's all. Uh -huh. See, there aren't many people that insist that this is what happens. Now, of course, if this doesn't happen, now we got bad results. If God the Father doesn't do what Scripture says He does, and if Jesus doesn't do what Scripture says He does, and the Holy Spirit doesn't do what Jesus says He does, we're not going to get the results that baptism says occur. Amen. So if we didn't get the results, <laughs> we ought to know why. And the one, in addition to this, the involvement of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the ones being baptized, they're, they're involved in this too. I mean, how could it be that the whole God is involved with the people being baptized aren't? They submitted to the ordinance. Yes. Here's water. Mm -hmm. What does it be, be baptized? They're the ones who are told, stop tarrying now. Some people need to be told this. Yeah. How come you're tarrying? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. I mean, the pressure's got to be applied. Yes. Amen. If people say, I believe that, what are you waiting on? Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Tell it to the people. The, the people are involved, too. If they're not involved, then it's just pointless to talk about the other involvements. <coughs> now, as I said, this takes place at the point we're baptized. If you look at it from a appearance, it looks like the person's going down in the water and coming up out of the water. And he, he is. Yeah. But that's the form yeah. of the doctrine. Yeah. The doctrine, that's where the meat is. The, the meat isn't in the form, although the form's got to match the doctrine. Uh -huh. yeah. The doctrine is Christ died, was buried, and rose again. That's a doctrine. So in baptism, you die, mm -hmm. you're buried, and you're raised from the dead. So if the form doesn't agree with the doctrine, then it's a vain form. Yeah, that's right. Some people talk about a mode of baptism. Baptism doesn't have different modes. Amen. Baptism is the mode. Amen. There's one baptism. Right. So Amen. you don't Sprinkle water on a baby and say, I'm now I'm burying you and I'm going to into Christ's death. I'm going to raise you from the See, that doesn't agree with the form. Yeah. Yeah. Now, someone might raise, well, what about the Spirit? God 
spoke of baptizing the Spirit, he poured forth the Spirit. Well, that's right. You can baptize a person in engulfment water if you have enough water. God poured it out abundantly and it engulfed the, yeah. the people. They, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, which totally surrounded them just like the water did their body. So this baptism all takes place one baptism all takes place at this occasion. I see a lot happens at that occasion when the person is baptized Amen. into Christ. And this, you've got to believe that this, you, see, you have to believe this actually occurred. Now most of us didn't know this till after we were baptized. We actually, our hearts were right, we felt convicted we should be baptized, but it might have been years later before we actually we're told what actually happened. Yeah. In fact, this is what happened at Rome. They've been, they've been Christians for some time, and Paul in the sixth chapter told them what happened. They were baptized. When I made this uh, series of videos, I selected the five things I thought people needed to know that I couldn't think of anyone that was telling them this. One was what happened at your baptism. The other was the uniqueness of the new covenant. The third was the high priesthood of Christ. The fourth was inner conflict and his remedy. And the fifth was Christ's second coming. And I felt that these things were things not being said. The most popular series Good News ever produced was what happened at your baptism. Once people heard it, I mean, genuine believers they, they knew it. as soon as they heard it oh they knew it. they knew it. they were identified with it it's just that they hadn't been told that's the one baptism that we're Amen. talking so it's bigger than what you did it includes what god did what christ did what the spirit did and this all occurred and at one point in time this all occurred there and that's the one baptism it's the baptism that gets done what needed to get done. See? Amen. I think I'll close there. And if you have a word you'd like to add? Yes, Brother Levine. I don't know if progression plays a part in when we're reading Scripture, but I, I see the importance of the order in which verse 5 is put. Oh, yes. You know, one Lord, one faith. One, you know, because oh, yes. it, it, it's, it's the Lord, and then it's our faith, and then, then baptism. in your faith you understand yes, right. no, what God's doing through baptism. You are right. There's yeah. a priority in this. Yes, there yeah. is. Uh -huh. Yes. But the particular things that involve us, of course, God is at the end, it's like the wrap-up. It's not like he's bottom priority. It's like he can, wraps the whole thing up. That's see, right. And it begins with Lord... Yeah, there is a progress in that. That's absolutely right. How can they hear without a preacher? Yeah, that's right. See, and then that starts the mm -hmm. progression. Amen. It's good to see that, too. Yes. Yeah. And then God, is, progression, we might call it increase, and God gives the increase. Yes, amen. But sometimes and, maybe that might be why people well, don't have a concept, the, the right yeah. concept or understanding of baptism, because there's something missing here. Uh -huh. Like oh, faith? <laughs> oh, yeah. Possibly? I have a personal opinion on this, <laughs> that the people who accent baptism are largely responsible for Absolutely. this condition because their lives don't match their doctrine. And so the people who aren't baptized are actually have a more holy appearance than the people. So this is, they don't listen to, they don't listen to all those arguments because it, they can see that it, what they do has a, what this baptism they're talking about hasn't done anything. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So I think that if all the people were baptized were new creatures, then the word would carry more significance to the, to the people. So a lot of people, I think in their heart, there are people who see this. It just remains for it to be spoken. And then once it's spoken, see, that then the Spirit goes to work. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. So you may say it and you may see no visible results, but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be any results. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Jonathan? 
Always nice to be able to hear someone talk about baptism without saying the words, well, this doesn't mean. Yeah, I know. Because usually when I hear anyone else speak about it, that's what yeah. they're saying after every verse they read. But it's a real shame that to be in a generation that discourages yeah. people in baptism, you have her going over all the things that occur in it. We even had a sister here baptized recently when we talked to her. Actually, like, well, what held you back all this time? She said she said she's heard so much controversy and so much about. It, she just kind of was afraid to even have anything to do with yeah. it. When she saw it, she had no problem yeah. going in with it. Yeah. And then, baptism is one of the clearer subjects of scripture, yeah. and it's one of the clearer. Yeah. So an enemy's done this. Amen. And if, oh, go ahead, with, her, with her sermon on a trip, I think it was one of the trips that we took up to Indiana. No, it wasn't. Well, we were in Memphis, and we stopped on Sunday morning, a huge congregation. Mm -hmm. And the preacher that morning preached from Romans 6. And the only time he mentioned anything about baptism was when he read the text at the beginning. <laughs> from then on, for 40 minutes, yeah. he never mentioned baptism. Yeah. And see, the apostles assume mm -hmm. that believers are baptized. You were baptized. You, right. you were baptized in Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ. So if we, people say, well, is that water baptism or is that spirit baptism? And you just say, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> see, that's an erroneous question because more, more happens than what's happening in the water. Yeah. That happens, but more... Yes, amen. See, that, the fact that you're baptized in water, that's what puts a handle on this mm -hmm. yeah. for you. Now you can go back to a yeah. point in time. Yeah. You knew you obeyed the do yeah. form of the doctrine, and now, you, now you're able to take hold of what happened at yeah. that time. Yeah. You take the form away, yes. how would you know? This is amazing, bro. I was six years old when I was introduced to baptism. My parents were baptized when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. We were immersed into Christ. And I was 36 before I ever heard anyone say what you've said. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you were the one who said it 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tragedy, really. It's, it is. It's a form of spiritual robbery. Yeah, That's it is. right. Yeah. Because it's, when you said it, I immediately yeah, saw all yeah. these things oh, yeah. that I had read yeah. it was and, in your heart, and see? taught in the scripture myself. All these, all that, all just fell together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's as reasonable as can be. So, with one or two statements. See that? Remember, you said you'd write His law in their hearts. Yeah. Now, this is what that means. When the law is written on your heart, I mean, you don't you don't know what the scripture says, but when you hear it, uh -huh. there's an accord yeah. between your. It's around your heart. You ha you have an inclination to this, and you can like see it. Yeah. That's the genius of the kingdom. Uh, That's the the, the day dawns, yes. and what you see, the light has always been there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the light didn't begin yeah. when we saw it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You said an enemy's done this. You got a question? Why would anyone want to stand in the way of a person having a good conscience yeah. towards God? It just it doesn't even make spirit no. spiritual sense at all. Well, it goes, it goes to the fact of sectarianism. Yeah. There are certain yeah. sects that have to be maintained with this teaching. Is this Tasha? Yeah, this is one of the first things that you actually physically do that's in agreement with the Father, that's the right. Son, and the Holy yeah. Spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there, there'll be times whenever the enemy will try to, try to convince you that you aren't in yeah. agreement mm -hmm. with the Father, the Son, and the Holy yeah. Spirit. And this is a time, like you said, that it's, it's a tangible... Something right. you can get a hold of to That's be able right. to combat against give a date the enemy. To it. Yeah. You can give a date. Yeah. Yeah. Now you see, this is something the ceremonies of the law didn't have. This. They did not have this. They they were figures. Yeah. Now we can look back at some of the ceremonies that we see all kind of likenesses back there, but they didn't because the reality hadn't happened yet. Right. See, the, the sin hadn't been taken away yet. Once sin is taken away, and you know it's taken away, now you're, you, you're able to see what you, you just have to be said, and you can see it. I'll tell you an account of, uh, his name was Harold Losey, blessed brother. He came to Christ, he was 55. He's a German Lutheran, hard, hard man. His mother was old German Lutheran. And for years, Harold hated his mother. 
and he divulged it to me one day, and we were, he worked for me, and he was where he worked, and he divulged it because he felt guilty about doing it. And I said, why did you hate your mother, Earl? He said, she used to beat me with a broomstick until the broomstick broke. And she said, I really hadn't done anything wrong. She just, and he said, so I said, well, you, you got to get over this. All right, some time passed. He come to me. He said, Brother Given, I see now. God made my mother do that because I chase an easy. Yeah. And I noticed that in Brother Harold. Everybody knowing God never had to convict him twice or anything. First time he always got it. All right, he determined he wanted to see his mother baptized. Four or five years, he tried to talk her into it. He was getting very, very frustrated at it. He was getting old. She was about 85. And he was just reading through the gospel to her, and he read where Jesus was baptized. Just, just read the account. She said, wait, wait. Do you mean my Lord was baptized? He said, yes. She said, then I want to be baptized. He came to me, he said, I wasted all those three to five years trying to talk her into it, and all she needed to know was her Lord was baptized, and that was good enough for her. <laughs> well, I see this. A lot of this is that simple. Yeah, right. You really, if you did, if you did know, G this has to be what converted the eunuch. I don't think Philip was preaching baptism to the eunuch. Right. He preached Christ, and when he told it Christ was baptized, yeah. he was said, "Well, why can't I be baptized then?" Yeah. Brother that's exactly what happened to me. I was reading through the Bible when I first became a believer, and when I read that Jesus was baptized, I went down to the nearest church that I knew that they were doing baptisms and got in line. Yeah. They had a group of people that they'd be going through a, like a special course, and I just walked up there and got in line. <laughs> yeah, we had. Uh, I forget the name. I forget the name of the film strip. Do you remember those film strips? Jewel Miller. Jewel Miller. It was a five week before yes. five week course before you could be baptized. Yeah. Yeah. Lord help if you were a quick learner. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for the way you've opened up salvation to us. And it is glorious to see and refreshing to the spirit to not have questions, but to be able to give praise with thanksgiving for the marvelous way you've saved us. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.